Alrighty, part one of Proof of Causation, and I need to apologize. At the end of the last episode on torts, I said we're going to be getting into how to prove negligence. That was a mistake of speech. I meant to say getting into how to prove causation. And we have several cases. Like I said, this is part one. And so we'll just go over a couple of these cases to say what and how do you prove causation. Let's begin with Reynolds versus Texas and Pacific Railroad Company. What happened here is that the plaintiff in this case uh, was told to uh, hurry up because the train was running late, but it was coming. It was late in the evening. So she gets up, she starts running down the stairs. There's no handrail, there's no lights, and she ends up tripping, falling down the stairs, and uh, sustaining several injuries. And she says, well, there should have been lights, and there should have been a handrail there. And the defense in this and says, well, she could have tripped during the day. And so there's no way to show that our negligence, because, yeah, you can say that we should have had the had it lit, and you can say that we should have uh, had the handrail there, but there's no way of saying that our negligence actually caused her to trip because she could have tripped during the daytime. And so what this is, is really making an argument of post hoc ergo prop, propter hoc, which is, again, Latin, and ultimately that translates to just because Z comes after Y, that does not mean that Y caused Z. What that is just saying is that just because something comes after something else actually doesn't mean that that's the cause. That's the argument of the defense here. And the court says, yes, we can recognize that that is the case, but the plaintiff needs to prove that negligence great is greatly multiplied their chances of injury, and that was done here. Because had it been let, and had and there been a handrail, the possibility of injury would have gr- been greatly reduced. So you can say that their negligence increased the chance that the plaintiff was going to be injured here. And this gets into what needs to be proved in causation. So in criminal law, you need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. But in torts, we just need to view the preponderance of the evidence, which just means that the plaintiff needs to prove that it's more likely than not. So they need to prove that it's more likely than not. Had there been negligence, there would have been no injury. Next case is Gentry versus Douglas Hereford Ranch. And what happened here? It's kind of a funny case. It's a sad case. Funny funny for um, some instances, but sad in others. What happened here is that there's this defendant, no longer a defendant for reasons we'll get into. The defendant was at the ranch's house. Uh, the plaintiff's spouse and the defendant's wife was painting the interior of the house and the dude probably didn't want to paint the interior of the house so he's like I'm going hunting so he goes out he grabs his gun for the truck he's coming back in probably just to say goodbye and the plaintiff's spouse comes out he trips at the same time the gun discharges and she passes uh, several weeks later from injuries sustained from that discharge. So this dude's probably in a lot of family trouble because he didn't want to paint the house, first of all, and then he caused this injury, and then he got sued because of this injury, and then he filed bankruptcy uh, so that he would no longer be sued because he had debt. He filed bankruptcy, which stays any existing cases against you. And so grandma ends up getting sued, the ranch owner. And so let's just say he's in a lot of family trouble as well as legal trouble. So what's the claim to negligence against the ranch? Because, well, he's not a defendant in this case anymore. Grandma's the defendant in the case. 
the claim against the ranch is that the steps not been maintained and that he tripped over the steps. So the plaintiff is saying that he tripped over the steps and the steps need to not be maintained. There needs to have been some negligence in the maintaining of the steps in order to actually show that grandma's negligence caused the injury. In other words, it becomes essential to determine what caused the original defendant, Bacon, to stumble. And the issue that we have here is that in uh, deposition, Bacon didn't remember what he stumbled on. Could have been clumsiness. Could have been the steps. He couldn't tell you. Previously, in an investigation, he did say that he thought it was the stairs. But deposition, because you're under oath, tends to be seen as more, maybe not reliable, but more important. It's valued more than previous statements because it, it's if you lie in deposition, you could be guilty of perjury. So there's higher stakes, and so they're expecting you to not lie in deposition. Because he didn't know what he tripped on, the evidence here is so speculative that the plaintiff's claim is so speculative that they can't determine what caused him to trip. He could have been clumsy, could have tripped over his own feet, or it could have been the steps. And because of the speculation, the courts won't say that the plaintiff proved causation. We have one last case. We have Kramer Service Inc. versus Wilkins. And what happened here is that person walked under a door frame, opened the door, glass fell from it, they sustained a cut. And a couple of years later, they got skin cancer in the exact place where the cut occurred. They were not able to find cause here because the expert testimony said that there's no way of knowing what causes cancer. We don't know if cancer can be caused by a traumatic experience that occurred at the site of the cut. One testimony said that it was a one out of 100 pers- uh, one out of 100 chance that it would have happened, and another expert testimony said that there was no chance of it ever happening. Big takeaways from this is that defendants are allowed to provide testimony. Uh, in such a way that it makes the plaintiffs a burden and difficult to prove a certain inference of a cause. Uh, The defendants don't need to prove other things, meaning they don't need to prove that other things are probable. They only need to prove that other things could happen, in other words, that things are possible. So they they are not required to provide probable evidence, but they do need to provide possible evidence, so to speak. That makes sense. And then finally, uh, getting into medical malpractice cases, going back to Scott versus Branford with informed consent. Remember the but for cause there. One of the elements was causation. Going back to that, informed consent is that if a person was informed, then they would not have consented, meaning their information or lack of cause them to consent. And so that's where am I trying to go with this? That's the subjective test and the benefit for that is uh, bodily autonomy. I'm not sure what that has to do with Wilkins but it was in the notes. And so it's just a review of what informed consent was and how causation is an essential element of informed consent. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Law Schoolers. Before I let you go, there are four things I want to say. The first thing is if you enjoyed these episodes and if you enjoyed the website, I would invite you to go and join Law Schoolers Pro. And you can do that by going to lawschoolers.com slash join. It's a way for you to support us, but there's also a lot of features there that I think you will enjoy. 
Second thing is that nearly all of our episodes are unedited. The only ones that aren't are pre-law materials. And the reason for that is so you can actually see the legal material in its raw form as I'm learning it as well. The third thing is that the information contained in these episodes are specifically only for educational purposes. They're not to be used as legal advice. And with that, the fourth thing is if it is used as legal advice, we are not liable. That is, law schoolers is not liable for any legal outcomes. Thank you again for enjoying the show. Have a good one.